So as long as you have Google Chrome, you can go to the Chrome App Store thing and uh, search for Photosync and it's there. Uh, and it, does, it gets automatically updated when we release new versions of objects. So I'll just show you an example um, measurement from this and then show you a couple of other things you can do in there. And then, and then, and then, and then I really want to um, uh, pick someone's experiment and start to talk about how you might actually set it up. Because there's a lot of tricky stuff in there, and I want to at least have you guys see that. OK, so right, same questions, but now they're over here. Um, uh, so I'll just blah. I won't submit this. Of course, you don't have to submit your answers. If you screwed up, um, you don't have to submit your answers. You go up here. Um, and you connect. So this is USB connected. You do have to remember to turn on the power. It'll work even without the power. Um, but having power on will give you basically a better quality signal. Um, it gives you all, it's all kinds of little doodads in here, like gives you little updates, you sign in, uh, all kinds of stuff. It's pretty awesome. Sebastian made it. Um, so we do the same thing as we did before we clamped it. We press go walks you through each measurement, and then it gives you all the data just like you did here. What's cool about this one is if you, if, you, um, if you wanted to take 20 of these in a row, like you clamped it to a leaf and you wanted to do 20 in a row, it would actually switch output mode so that it shows you these outputs like Fly2 in a graph continuously as they get created. You'll see it go like that. So it has some neat functionality. Um, or you can do that with CO2 or temperature or whatever. Um, so it's pretty neat. In addition, um, uh, you can actually create your own protocols. So these methods like FB or FN, FI2, and MPQ, um, there are tools in here for you to create them. So for example, uh, here's chlorophyll fluorescence. This has all the parameters that are going to define my measuring pulses, my saturating pulse, all that stuff. So if you're super geeky and you want to make your own stuff, you can do that. Uh, in addition, we have to have, so that's a protocol creation tool if you create your measurement. Uh, and then there's also a macro creation tool because we have to be able to take this data that gets outputted from this raw trace and convert it into our usable values like Phi2 and FB or FM, right? Um, so we have a script tool, a macro development tool, uh, which is right here. Um, so where you actually take one of those scripts and then you build a macro, build, or take one of those traces, build a macro on top of it. So I'll show you an example one, our standard chlorophyll fluorescence. Oh, I'm not online. Um, but normally it would show chlorophyll fluorescence trace here. It would show all the variables that got outputted with that trace. And then um, we can uh, generate our FERM and all that sort of stuff over here in JavaScript. And it's not nearly as complicated as it looks, because I mean, you, you did it in relatively short order without any JavaScript experience. On, on a fairly complicated, like long, detailed So OK, that's all I wanted to show you. Um, any more questions about this stuff? So you don't have to actually do these deep things to make no, this Totally right. Okay. Yeah. But you may want to, yeah, when you're developing your project, modify things. Work. Let's say you would like to do um, ECS traces uh, after dark, during dark adapting a plant. That's a great thing. Uh, and uh, you might want to build a little macro to do that. Yeah. People in our lab can help you. Yeah, we will definitely help you. I asked you earlier on whether you were, any of you were programmers. And, uh, we'll make programmers out of you. Yeah. <laughs> it's not so. <coughs> Okay, so then the last thing um, I want to talk about um, is, um, so in our experience, we've gone through this process now with you know, 10 or 20 people, um, like bean breeders and wheat breeders and a bunch of people have made projects, and kind of learned some lessons from that, even just yesterday, about creating a project and setting up an experiment. Um, and and, and you know some of this other stuff is hard. It's hard to interpret results and things. But actually, by far the hardest part is um, getting this stuff right and asking the right questions. So I wanted to like pick someone's project who feels like they have a pretty decent sense of what they want to do, or at least could make it up. 
and then just kind of like pick at it and see if we can um, answer some of these questions. Any willing participants? Brad? Yeah, I, mean, I, I want to see if phi 2 goes up over time. I guess. In, in what? In, I mean, I want to do it in cyanobacteria. Um, over time, you mean as they get older? So if we induce them to export sucrose, I want to see if phi 2 increases at whatever time it increases. So like yeah. I want to take measurements every hour, and hopefully at one point it will increase. So you, you essentially, at minimum, have two treatments. You have your control and then your sucrose induction. And why yeah. do you want to take this data? For what reason? Um, so my thesis project is kind of um, like zinc regulation of photosynthesis. So um, photosynthesis is regulated based on the amount of stored energy in the system. So if you have too much sucrose, basically it'll feed back on the electron transport chain and downregulate it. So if you give it, if you give a plant or a cyanobacteria an alternative sink where they just export this energy or carbon, they'll actually increase their flux through the electron transport chain and basically increase their quantum yield of photosystem too. Cool. Um, any other questions? Okay, so isn't this a local project? Is there, was there, is there any possibility it would be useful for someone else to do with you? No. It's pretty like you, you have to control it. Why, why would the world care about this? Um, ask that question if I could. So, I mean... Accord, How would the world use this? Accord, Let's say you're successful, you proved it. How would the world use it? So you would engineer a plant, a plant to have alternative sinks. So, I mean, corn, one of its major sinks is an ear of corn. If you figure out how um, that stored energy feeds back on photosynthesis, you could uncouple those two and just get them to do more photosynthesis without recognizing that they already have stored sugars. So does that mean you're making an ear of corn with more sugar content so it's going to be sweeter? Does that mean, is that from a very layman standpoint? Theoretically, yes. I mean, yes. More, more or could you take field yeah, more and more ears of corn. Oh, I mean, or, or, could you take, or could you take a piece of field corn and convert it into sweet corn? Through this, if you if you were successful, yes. I mean, I guess that's very very far down the line. I just the first step is actually proving that sugar actually feeds back on photosynthesis. Okay, I guess so. That's the step that I'm at. Okay. Cool. It, yeah, it's basically like applying. It's the plant applying breaks to photosynthesis. So saying I don't want to produce any more um, sugar. I I don't because I have enough. And so that's like, let's say you have a corn growing, a, a plant of corn. Um, it's going to not grow as much corn as it theoretically could because it's, you know, it's paying attention for the long, long term. It's trying to keep its photosystems not harmed by light. Um, and if it produces too much, um, it can damage it in the long term. But if you're, say, a farmer, you're only going to have that ear of corn or that, or that corn plant for a year, so you can ease up on those breaks. But we need to know how that brake system works. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So okay, so this is a local project, so you don't have to worry too much about dealing with other people, which makes it a lot easier. Um, so what measurements do you think you need? So at this point, just by two. That's sort of the minimum, the minimum required information to prove an initial point, basically. Um, yes. Would you also want to have a FE or FM or dark, dark values uh, at some point? Um, possibly. Um, it's kind of hard to interpret them just based on state transitions right now. I don't know enough about them. So I would mostly just want operating efficiency at this time. Right. And one light intensity, multiple light intensity? Um, <coughs> naturally simulated light intensities? <laughs> for, the, for the sake of my project, I would like to keep it simple, so just one light intensity. Right. 
But it is possible that the mechanism only appears under more natural conditions too, right? So. He wants to find the conditions where he's right. That's my problem. Don't miss it if, it's, if, it, if you're so, writing against this. So this, I, I guess, this idea of source sync doesn't really work if you're in light limited conditions, because mm -hmm. then light is limiting photosynthesis, right. nothing right. else is. So it has so to be high light. It has to be enough light. enough light that light is not limiting. Got it. Okay. Well, yeah. yeah. So light level, at least you need to know what it is um, at a minimum to get started. So in cyanobacteria, it's 100 micro Einsteins. Wow, that's pretty low. For plants. <laughs> Probably not for bacteria. Yeah. Cool, okay. Um, okay, so that feeds into, perfectly relevant, what, so every time you take a measurement, when you set up your project, you're gonna ask yourself a series of questions, quote unquote, right? example, what species of cyanobacteria is this? What is the light level? Maybe that's your question. If you want to do multiple, you might be able to do that. Or um, yeah, so, that kind of stuff. so I actually have a project made. Are you already made one project? Yeah, and it has three questions. What what species or um, how many hours after induction? And then I forget I forget the third one. Right. Yeah, I mean treatment, yes or no, right? Yeah. Treatment, basically, yeah. I mean I need to so this is a long time ago, so I need to change yeah, these questions, useful. but... Because right. you're controlling for everything else, right? So, like, throughout the experiment, you're taking things to always be constant, so you don't have to ask a question for that on the pro in the, like, project, right? Yeah, so the only... Yeah. So I guess the, the, only, field, the like, only condition that should control. be changing is whether I induce or don't induce, or so that's control yeah. plus induced. And I'll, so let me make a suggestion too, just because this relates to like how we structure the protocols. Um, what Sam suggested before is make a test project that's sort of junk, like play with it, figure it out, and then make a real project. And that's, that's a good way to do it. Um, if you want to, if you have a project where you've already collected some data and you realize you want to make fairly significant changes, like I want to add two user questions and I want to change the way I'm doing things, you can still do it in that project, but you need to make sure that um, when you go to run your filters, when you filter things out, you can filter them easily still. Otherwise, you're going to get old measurements you didn't want in with your new ones, and you're not going to be able to see the, you know, the stuff you want. Add so. enough metadata yes. to distinguish uh, the, the experiment you want to see. Right. OK. I guess, I don't know if Greg didn't talk about the uh, Analysis tools that are online. Yes, yet. let's do that. I kind of I wanted to do a little bit. Yeah, we, How much time? When, when should I stop? Well, about a half an hour ago. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you should have told okay. me. Yeah, everyone, so. are, no, everyone was seemed to be enjoying themselves yeah. yeah. here. So. Should I? Can I? Do, I'll do five minutes on the analysis. Yes, yeah, so they'll be able to measure things and, and look at them, but they won't know what they mean because they didn't tell them. Sorry. That's okay. Uh, okay. 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 Um, so right, analysis tool. Let's go look at our data actually. Um, so uh, if you go to the project and you click on dashboard just like you saw me do, uh, you can see the data that we just collected as long as the devices were connected to the internet. Uh, if they're not, it caches the data and when you come back you hit sync data and it pushes it. So it's no problem. If you're offline it will catch them. Um, so we can see things like, uh, you know, all of our values. These are um, light intensity values. This just kind of shows you um, some different points. Uh, okay, let's do a different one. Let's, yeah, with some data in it, yes. Uh, actually, that, let's do the one in uh, this one. Mm -hmm. So they collected a bunch of data in Malawi yesterday. Um, so there's a, that just shows you the histogram of the light intensity, so what the typical values are in the edges. Just sort of quick stuff. Um, but if you go to plot, you can start to plot any of those outputs that you saw on the screen, phi2, fs, fm prime, all that stuff, is going to show up here. So let's look at um, LEF by, by light intensity. And this is something you probably want to look at because it's just, it's going to, it tells you pretty quickly if your data is like reasonable or if it's sort of crappy. Because it should always pretty much look like that. Um, so linear electron flow goes up as light intensity goes up. And if there's something way off the line like this guy, you should, 
it's suspect, right? So let's click on it. If we click on it, you can see the specifics. And you can see, yeah, that was crap, right? Like he's moved his hand or something funny happened. Um, so you can flag that data. This is a new feature. Uh, and when you do, you'll add a comment why, why it's bad. Uh, and not quite yet, but in the future, that data will automatically get excluded from your plots. Um, but not from the database. Correct. Never, yeah, it'll no. always be there. And you can include it back in if you want to. You can say, show me the bad stuff. Do you know what time these were taken? Uh, yes. 8.30 in the morning. Yeah. 8.30 in the morning. Okay. If you go to here. There's time stamp in the There's time stamp yeah. GPS. So Geotech. it's the time, GPS. the date, mm -hmm. the firmware version on the device, uh, all the answers to their questions, their user questions. So you can see here, these are all the questions that they asked for the measurement. Um, so we can actually uh, import every combination of possible questions, which at this point is relatively small. On big projects, don't do that, because it could be a lot. Um, and uh, so now you can see, these are all the different combinations. Um, and you can even see it on the map. So these were taken in a field in Malawi. Um, and you can sort of basically see the outline of the field. Um, so it be that one. That is so sweet. So again, you can get pretty good stuff here. And you see layer class. Right, yep. Um, and you can also, of course, download your data. So there's links to that single data view here as well. But this is all of your data. Um, and it has all the user answers, and then it has all of the macro outputs like Pi2 and all that stuff. And you can download it, just click on save, and it saves it as a CSV. Uh, I think the CSV shows fixed, so it should be easy. Um, and then you can analyze it in whatever you want. So I'll give you an example next step analyzing in one minute. So you can take this, this output, and you can put it into something like Statling, or R, or your, your favorite statistical analysis software. And I want to show you an example of what you can do. So this was uh, Mohammed, who works um, with Wayne Mosher. He does bean stuff. He had 60 different plants. Uh, his goal was to identify differences in treatment of a micronutrient called boron, if the effect on the common bean. He had seven different treatments. He had two treatments that he thought were going to be sort of the winners and show significant difference in Phi2 and chlorophyll content in the leaf. So um, visually, you can see absolutely no difference. Uh, he didn't have to grow them to the point where he produced seed pods and, and did seed pod counts or anything. This was all just when they were still relatively young. Uh, and I want to show you the results of that. Now, we have to do a little statistics and do regression, but that is super simple, and I'm happy to show you how to do that. Um, um, but you can see, so what this says is SPAD, which is chlorophyll content, for the entire population, an average is 72. Um, what is that in? Boy, oh, yeah, it's hard to read. What is the projector is going Yeah, this projector is terrible. Bummer. That's where all this stuff is. Maybe if I highlight over it. No. Okay. Shoot. What do you need to do projector? Um, you can just show it on your screen. Yeah, I'll show it on my screen. You guys can see it. What's the um, unit for SPAD? Um, arbitrary units. Arbitrary so units. There is a correlation coefficient that they introduce. So a 72 SPAD would be something like how many chlorophyll per. It's not. You don't have that. You, you could if you calibrated it yourself, but there's no fix. Yeah. Even device to device, there's variation in that. It's good to control for device because each device is a little different. But again, when you're doing regression models, you can do that fairly easily. I can't do SPAD in a liquid culture, though, can I? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can do it. Okay, in so... Your case, you might want to do more wavelengths because you have the colors. You should be able So our SPAD is saying SPAD is 72.3, and it's two points higher if it's a bottom leaf. It's eight points lower, meaning it's more yellow if it's a top leaf. And that's independent of light intensity and treatment. That's like just that's just a leaf age effect. So older leaves are yellower, younger leaves in general, or mid mid, mid aged leaves are greenest. Um, he has seven boron and sorbitol treatments. His expected winner was T6, and you can see that T6, yes indeed, it is. You know, the spad goes up by 
two and a half points for T6 as compared to T1, which is this control treatment. So that's like significant effect, basically. And that's a really minor effect. You can't see that visually. Um, and um, you can see the same effect on Phi2. It's a little less significant. This program's really nice. It shows you residuals and everything. Um, so you can see what Phi2 is. And then you can see, again, that same effect. And uh, it is significant for T6 at 0.02. Um, so the point is, you don't just have to be like, this leaf is yellow and this leaf is green and gee, I can spend $100 to tell the difference between the two. That's stupid. So we can do stuff that's a lot more nuanced than that. If you collect sufficient amounts of data, if you do it, if you do it right, like one thing about Muhammad is he spent three hours in the morning and three hours in the afternoon for five days, but he has the best data by far of anybody and it's very significant and good. So if you set it up right at the beginning, take your time, you can really tell small differences. I guess that was my any questions for, for Greg? We get a lot of people pestering you. So, okay. Um, what I had planned to do was. <laughs> I didn't think that. No, 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 it was going great. And I, you know, this is the first time we've ever done this. So, um, did everyone get a chance to make a measurement? We all have Android phones. Good, cool, good phone. I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> I have an old one at home, but it doesn't have a SIM card, so. I don't think it uh, Well, eventually. If you well, you can borrow one of our tablet things here. Yeah. That's fine. Okay, so. Um, yeah, you don't use SIM cards. Why? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we have a lot of time. Um, okay. Turn that thing off. Uh, now, looking at the projects that we discussed last time, I picked three uh, methods that would be useful for your core balance. Most of them, most of these can be, all except for one, that's my Oscar here, can be performed with this device. And so, um, and they're, they're also very basic uh, tool techniques that, that are used in photosynthesis research all the time. So if you're doing anything related to photosynthesis, this is the, these are the first things you would go for. And you'll see tons of papers uh, using these kinds of techniques. Uh, you'll see tons of papers where the techniques are used incorrectly. Uh, one, of the, one of the regrets of my career is that we published this paper a few years ago on new techniques, new fluorescence parameters. And there are thousands of papers using these. And they'll use all of them without any indication that they understand what they mean. Uh, some of them are useful for particular applications, and some of them are completely absurd. When I mean the, the, the techniques are good, but, but their application, their application they, they, yeah, they're like they just a bunch of data. So, um, so there are three. There are three things. Um, do you mind if I go a little over, and then I can I can continue and we'll have something. I have class right after this. Oh, but so we'll. You can go ten minutes over. I can go ten minutes over. That's good. So. Okay, there are, three, there are three techniques that I thought would be useful. One is some of the chlorophyll fluorescence parameters, of course. Those are probably the, the first step you would go to. Uh, the second are the, some of the absorption techniques. Uh, in particular, I was thinking about photosystem one absorption technique and the electrochromic shift. And although this is not working ideally here. And then there were a couple of you were interested in measuring the effects on antenna in cyanobacteria. And so Otsko has developed uh, an instrument that's similar to this. It's much bigger. Uh, and it can do the same sorts of measurements um, at multiple wavelengths or excite multiple wavelengths. And what you can do with this is do it what we call an action spectrum and find out what the efficiency of light transfer from antenna of different wavelengths, different colors, into both photosystems in each one. And you'll get a map or a graph of how efficiently that is, or how much energy is going there. So the question you can answer with, with this kind of approach is, when you have a certain condition, let's say she's now studying uh, the acclimation of uh, Framiella, which is a sign of bacteria, uh, to different light qualities and the antenna change. And you can see whether or not that balance is maintained, whether the same amount of light's going to both photosystems or 
have more going to photosynthesis as you would. And there are mutants that die under certain light conditions, and that might be explained by this. This is this is the very technical part. It's okay. 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 So let's start let's start immediately with um, with fluorescence techniques, and it's all based upon certain assumptions. Uh, and you can derive these in your spare time. I do this all the time. I recommend it. See, everyone in my lab has to <laughs> derive uh, uh, the basic equations that tell you really how these things work. If you remember from an earlier lecture, um, we described the photosynthetic uh, apparatus and the photosynthetic unit um, for photosystem two as simply these, these blobs here. These would be the antenna and the photosystem two reaction center. And then down here is the oxygen evolving complex, the thing that splits water. Um, if you have four photons, four photons of light comes over here. And then you'll get four electrons moved over here. Four protons taken up here. And water split down there. The antenna, if you remember, uh, absorb light energy and transfer it uh, into the reaction center where electron transfer occurs. We also said that the light energy is absorbed by these chlorophylls in the antenna and it's transferred you know, by a random walk mechanism, more or less, until it gets to the reaction center here. At each step, there are several processes that can occur that compete for the energy, right, in the excited state of the chlorophyll. So we drew another diagram that looks something like that. We had light going in, and we have multiple processes by which that exciton could decay. And one of those would be to transfer to another chlorophyll. Okay. Or it can transfer to the reaction center and do photochemistry. So you say, okay, photochemistry here. And that makes an electron, electron transfer. We said there's always at each step a probability that that excitation energy is going to go to heat. It's just going to be dissipated. We call that KD here, heat. Then we, had, we know that when the plants are overexposed to light, that they turn off they make their antenna more, uh, less efficient. They dissipate more of that light energy. We call that non-photochemical quenching. Uh, so we can call that K and VQ. But we could, in fact, divide that up into multiple processes. KQE, which is the rapid irreversible form, and KQI, which is the slower, slowly reversible form. And then you have other processes, for example, Okay, inter-system crossing, which forms triplet states, uh, which are either quenched by carotenoids or uh, activate oxygen. And it uh, does damage. So we have this mess of things here, and really we want to measure specific processes. Okay? And we want to measure, the only thing that we can measure is, oh, the one that I didn't put on there. Okay, fluorescence. Okay, that we can measure, but we can't measure these other ones. Fortunately, um, by and large, these antenna systems obey something called the Stern-Volmer approximation. The Stern-Volmer approximation is what I showed you at the very first lecture, I think. We talked about kinetics and yield. Remember, we had this equation here. So if we want to know the yield, we're measuring this. We're measuring the yield of fluorescence that's coming out from here, from the antenna, something proportional to the yield of fluorescence there. We can describe that in terms of all of these. And it's simply the yield of fluorescence is equal to the rate constant for fluorescence divided by the sum of all these other rate constants. Okay? Kf plus Kd plus da -da 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 K plus uh, photochemistry. All of them. The trick to measuring something in, with this fluorescence technique is to measure it under two conditions where only one of those parameters is changed. Okay? So let's say 
that I have a situation where photochemistry is going along fine, and I can suddenly stop that, but I'm not affecting anything else. Okay? So I will have, let me draw it out, K, K, crossing, K, P, C, and this, we'll call this uh, steady state, okay? And over here, let's just call it X for now, we would have this equation. And zero, no intercept, no one chemistry. All right? Now all you need is a little bit of algebra, and you can derive th this. You can get this account. What we really want to know, though, is the yield of this. So we really want to know is KPC equals KPC over the sum of all these things. KF plus KD plus K... IPC. I'm sorry, you're right. And PC, you mean electrons going on to do useful stuff. Correct. Right. Electron transfer that's going on to right. fix carbon and so on. Okay, so how do we do this situation? Well, there's all of these rate constants, except for one, have one property. They're not saturable. In other words, if we increase the light intensity, they'll just keep increasing. However, photochemistry is saturable. So if I increase the background light intensity, I'll be putting more electrons to the system until they back up. And they can back up at the plastic quinone so we have all that reduced. We have QA reduced. And I can't put any more electrons into the system. At that point, photochemistry is completely blocked. All right? So this would be the steady state. And this is called Fm prime, uh, or Fm. And I'll get to why that is. So this is one technique using saturating and subsaturating light pulses to get at what the actual efficiency of photosynthesis is and what the, by extrapolation, you can get the rate of electron transfer. You can imagine setting up conditions where these other things, like a QE or QI, are the only things that change. And we'll talk about how to do that, too. And by doing that, you can now solve those equations and get those. But, so those are things like F or of M and QL and QI and all those things. They're all derived from this equation, basically, these sets of equations. Okay. And there's a paper that I, I gave you from, from our lab that went through and derived new ones. Basically easy. Okay, so how does it work? Okay, so Greg showed you the photosync device, and it has and he mentioned that it only measures signals that change. It doesn't measure the background light. Okay? So it has a light source that initiates fluorescence. It's a very weak one. In this case, it's orange, but it can be anything. But we're measuring the light that comes out in the infrared. We discussed what, what fluorescence was in the previous lecture. So this, that weak measuring light is modulated. The little pulses, if you look at it over time, the little pulse is 10 microns.